Hello, I'm Esther Gidoyot. It's Tuesday, July 5th. This is Africa 54. Sudan's military leader says the army is taking a step back from political discussions, opening the way for political and revolutionary groups to form a transitional government. The Africa Mercy, the largest charity-run hospital ship in the world, docks in Senegal to deliver free and safe surgical care to those in need. And as the war in Ukraine disrupts wheat exports to Africa, an entrepreneur in Benin finds that her services are in high demand. Democratic Republic of Congo's President Felix Shisekedi is scheduled to meet his Rwandan counterpart Paul Kagame for talks in Angola this week. There are no details on what they will discuss, but the neighbors have been at a diplomatic standoff since a surge of attacks in eastern Congo by the M23 rebel group, which Kinshasa accuses Kigali of backing. Rwanda defines a support, denies supporting the rebels and has in turn accused Congo of fighting alongside insurgents. In a wide-ranging interview in Rwanda's state broadcaster, Kagame says he did not mind Rwanda being excluded from a regional military force established in April to fight rebels in East Congo, removing a potential stumbling block to the initiative. Sudanese military leader General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan says the army is stepping back from political talks, clearing the way for political and revolutionary groups to form a transitional government. Paul Ndiho has more. Sudan's military leader Abdel Fattah al burhan has announced that the army will make way for a civilian government and would not participate in national talks facilitated by the United Nations and regional blocs. al burhan says the decision was taken to make room for political and revolutionary forces and other national factions to form a civilian government. The move comes months after the October coup ousted civilians from a transitional administration. It was decided first, the non-participation of the military institution in the current negotiations, which are facilitated by the tripartite mechanism to make room for political and revolutionary forces and other national factions to form a civilian government of independent national competencies. Widespread international condemnation and aid cuts followed the overthrow, the latest in the impoverished and northeastern African country. Burhan's televised announcement surprised ant coup demonstrators, hundreds of whom were on the fifth day of Syrian. After the formation of the executive government, the Sovereignty Council will be dissolved and a Supreme Council of the Armed Forces and the Rapid Support Forces will be formed to assume the supreme command of the regular forces and be responsible for security and defense tasks. Pro-democracy medics say nine demonstrators lost their lives, bringing to 114 the number killed in the crackdown against and coup protesters since October. The United Nations Human Rights Commission says some 335 have been arrested. In the weeks following the coup, the military and civilian leaders promised to hold general elections in July 2023. Sudan's leading civilian players had boycotted the talks with the military leaders launched under the international auspices last month to restore the transition. The United Nations, the African Union and the regional bloc Intergovernmental Authority on Development facilitated the dialogue. Barhani did not clarify the scope of the army's role in politics, but he says it will be committed to implementing the outcomes of the talks, which the UN and the African Union support. Paul Ndiho, VOA News. 
the Ethiopian Prime Minister and a rebel group are trading blame for a mass killing in Oromia, the country's most populous region, where hundreds of people have died in recent months in escalating violence between rival ethnic groups. The latest killings occurred Monday in two villages in the Kelem Wolega zone, around 400 kilometers west of Addis Ababa, according to the state-appointed Ethiopian Human Rights Commission. Both the Commission and Prime Minister Abe Ahmed blamed the Oromo Liberation Army, a band splinter group of an opposition party for the killings, which Abe called a massacre. OLA spokesman Oda Tarabi rejected the accusation, saying government allied militias are responsible for the deaths. A UN-appointed mission to Libya says there are probable mass graves yet to be investigated, possibly as many as 100, in a town where hundreds of bodies have already been found. The report to be submitted to the UN Human Rights Council this week details how a militia ran by seven brothers executed and imprisoned hundreds of people between 2016 and 2020. The evidence of kidnappings, murder and torture in Tarhuna uncovered by the independent fact-finding mission represents one of the most egregious examples of rights abuses since Muammar Gaddafi's ousting in 2011. Among the victims were the disabled as well as women and children. Tunisian President Kais Saeed says his proposed constitution will not restore authoritarian rule hitting back at criticism from across the political spectrum and urging people to support it in this month's referendum. Said, who ousted the elected parliament last summer to rule by decree in a step his foes call a coup, has published a draft of a new constitution that would greatly expand his powers while weakening checks on his actions. The president's supporters say he is standing up to the elite forces whose bungling and corruption have condemned Tunisia to a decade of political paralysis and economic stagnation. A local official in Burkina Faso says armed assailants killed at least 22 civilians in the country's northwest. It's the latest deadly attack in an area marred by militant activity. The attack has raided a rural commune in the province of Kosi, 55 kilometers from the border with Mali, early Monday morning. Burkina Faso has been battling Islamist militants in its northern regions, some with links to Al-Qaeda and Islamic State since 2015. The fighting has displaced more than 1.85 million people in the West African country and killed thousands across the Sahel. The Africa Mercy, the largest charity-run hospital ship in the world, is docked in Dakar, delivering free, safe surgical care to people who cannot access safe, affordable, and timely surgery. Hundreds of volunteers work on the medical vessel and offer their expertise for free to treat several health issues like cleft lips, and palates, club feet, burns, and several other conditions. Halil Gay reports from Dakar. In most African countries, health systems are characterized by underfunded public health facilities, and West Africa is lagging behind the rest of the continent. Here, hospitals and health centers are often called places to die. <coughs> Under such conditions, what would the future be for young Mohammed and Marie Madeleine, who suffer from deformities? Mohammed is a maxillofacial patient. It all started with a very small growth, says his father, Maktar. Mohammed had surgery at a local hospital to remove his tumor, but the operation did not go well. The tumor returned and was growing again. Father and son lost hope. 13-year-old Marie Madeleine is an orthopedic patient. She was bullied and mocked at school. Her grandma says it was very painful, but her granddaughter continued to make it to school. Marie Madeleine and Mohammed had no choice but to accept the general belief of their communities who think their condition is caused by supernatural forces or evil witchcraft. Only hope kept them alive. Marie Madeleine scans the horizon. In the distance, the island of Gore, from which, during slavery days, Western ships used to leave with slaves in subhuman conditions stored on the floor. But the ship she sees goes past the island to drop anchor at the port of Dakar. 
It is the Africa Mercy, the biggest hospital ship in service, a huge ship with a great mission to transform lives and serve nations. And hope floated on the Africa Mercy to the shores of Senegal, bringing joy and 21st century medicine free of charge to Marie Madeleine and Mohammed and to thousands with similar deformities. We are working on the problem of access to safe, affordable and timely surgery. And so we, we work on that problem through direct surgical care. So we come in with our hospital ships and offer free surgery to those that cannot access surgery for one reason or another. The Global Mercy, 175 meters long, 12 decks, and a crew capacity of 641 is the new ship, a much larger hospital that will allow treatment for many more patients than they can on the Africa Mercy. It is built with um, training of local healthcare providers in mind. So the spaces here are much larger to accommodate that um, observership and that mentorship and that training component. Wives who have been banished by their husbands or children mocked in schools return to their communities changed, radically transformed and worthy of finding their place back in the community with a new smile. Halil Gay for VOA News, Dakar, Senegal. A Nigerian Catholic priest was abducted in the town of Zambina in the northern state of Kaduna in the early hours of Monday, according to the local Catholic diocese. Parishioners searched for Father Emmanuel Silas after a lengthy wait for him to conduct the morning mass. It is not clear who carried out the abduction. Armed gangs are rife across Nigeria's northwest region where they rob or kidnap for ransom and violence is increasing. Zimbabwe's central bank says it is poised to sell gold coins in a bid to tame rising inflation that has weakened the local currency. David Doyle has the details. Zimbabwe's central bank says it will start selling gold coins this month. That move is a bid to tame runaway inflation, which has considerably weakened the local currency. The Mosi Otunya coin, named after Victoria Falls, will be available from July 25th in local currency, US dollars and other foreign currencies, said Central Bank Governor John Mangudja. In a statement on Monday, he said the coins would be priced based on the prevailing international price of gold and the cost of production. The coin, containing one troy ounce of gold, can be converted into cash and traded locally and internationally, the bank said. Not just our customers. Gold coins are used internationally by investors to hedge against inflation and wars. In Zimbabwe, soaring inflation has been piling pressure on a population already struggling with shortages. Annual inflation hit almost 192% in June. That's cast a shadow over President Emerson Mnangagwa's bid to revitalize the economy and stirred memories of the economic chaos under Robert Mugabe's nearly four decades of rule. Zimbabwe abandoned its inflation-ravaged dollar in 2009, opting to use foreign currencies, mostly the US dollar. The local currency was reintroduced in 2019, but quickly lost value. Last week, the South African country more than doubled its interest rates to 200% and outlined plans aimed at boosting confidence to make the U.S. dollar legal tender for the next five years. David Doyle of Reuters with that report. would like to hear your thoughts about Africa 54 and all our VOA Africa programs on our website at voaafrica.com. Still to come, building resilient health systems across Africa and beyond. But first, here's Hedy Adams to tell us what's on tap for Wednesday's Straight Talk Africa. On our special edition of Straight Talk Africa, South Sudan commemorates 11 years of independence. Has the promise of a new dawn for Africa's youngest nation been realized? What does the future hold for the people of South Sudan? We'll bring you in-depth analysis and reporting from the South Sudanese capital, Juba, as we discuss South Sudan, the road to democracy, on the next Straight Talk Africa. Health, wellness, sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. 
Healthy Living cares about your well-being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. Connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Lino Khmudu, in Washington every week on Healthy Living. Right here on VOA. And here's Africa's news roundup. After nearly a decade fighting jihadists in Mali, France is pulling its troops out of the country after falling out with its military junta. But Paris still intends to conduct anti-jihad operations in the Sahel. Cape Verde celebrates its 47th anniversary of Independence Tuesday as it deals with a severe food security crisis. Doctors Without Borders deploys a team of experts to Niger, southeastern region, where at least 30 cases of child malnutrition are recorded each day. And Guinea-Bissau's top court has overturned the convictions of two alleged drug kingpins in connection with the country's largest ever narcotic seizure. As war in Ukraine disrupts wheat exports to Africa, one entrepreneur in Benin is finding the demand spiking for her plantain flour. Clara Frank. Has more. Josiane Hodunu's small plantain flour business has almost doubled its production since the start of the war in Ukraine. With wheat flour becoming hard to find, some people see the cooking banana as a viable alternative. Walking through a plantain field just outside of Porto Novo in Benin, Hodunu is choosing the right fruits for her next batch of flour. Each plantain branch costs from $2.30 to $11, depending on the number of bananas per branch. Once she finds everything she needs, she heads back to her workshop to start the process. Odonu began producing plantain flour back in 2018 at a very small scale, but lately her production has nearly doubled. Before the war in Ukraine, I produced at least 80 kilograms per month. But now because of the war in Ukraine, which caused the price of wheat to increase and make it hard to find in the market, I produce up to 150 kilograms per month when the market is on. West Africa is facing its worst food crisis on record. Driven by Islamist insurgencies that have forced millions of people off their land in Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger and Nigeria. The region is also dealing with worsening floods and droughts linked to global warming. The war in Ukraine is making a dire situation even worse. The conflict is disrupting shipping in the Black Sea, a major artery for grains and other commodities, and it is throttling exports from Russia and Ukraine to markets including Africa. According to United Nations report on the impact of trade and development of the war in Ukraine, Benin has been importing all of its wheat supplies from Russia up until March 2022. Today, Odonu believes plantain is the way forward. According to the FAO, Benin produces around 19,000 tons of plantain per year. The fruit plays an important role in the local economy, and when processed into flour, it can be used to make bread, fritters, and cakes, and even thicken sauces. Generally, we use wheat, which is not local. It's not from here. Now that there is a crisis in Ukraine, wheat flour is becoming hard to find in markets, and it's also expensive. But we have bananas, plantains at our disposal. At our disposal, we can produce it. So that's why plantain flour has value. The start was a bit tedious for Odonu. She was only able to produce 20 kilograms of flour per month because she had to dry the plantain in the sun. Now using a hydrator, she is able to produce more at a faster pace. With the price of wheat flour increasing from 60 cents to over a dollar and the produce becoming harder to find in markets, small businesses are starting to use more of Odonu's flour. Clara Frank, VOA News. It's time for Health Report and joining us now is Africa 54 Health Correspondent Lino Mudu with the latest information on improving health security. Hello Lino. 
Hello, Esther. While well, experts say COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated the need to improve health security and build resilient health systems across Africa and beyond, vaccination programs, access to health care, and epidemic control are part of a health security strategies that can help countries better address recurring and emerging health crises. For more insight, I spoke with Dr. Trevor Mundell, president of the Global Health Division at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation? Well, I think, you know, we've seen uh, quite different um, situations break out across the continent. On the one hand, I think there's been some exciting acceleration in the digital health arena. People have adopted uh, various applications and platforms. There's been a surge in funding of startups in digital health. But we've also seen that there's been a challenge with a lack of infrastructure on the delivery side to really get out vaccines in the quantities that we'd like them to be getting out as suppliers become available, which really impacts and really is related to the state of health systems. In a number of countries, infrastructure is really not adequate for the needs of the populations. What are some of the major structural barriers to strengthening health security and health system in, in African countries? What has happened in Rwanda, and I had a, a great opportunity to visit some of the clinics here, is investment in primary health care, primary health care clinics across the country. So there's a very solid foundation of primary health care. That's been absolutely critical. There's been an investment in connecting these primary health care clinics digitally so that there's data available to know where problems are, where there might be some nutritional problems that need to be specifically addressed if there's a malaria outbreak. The other key intervention over here has been a national insurance scheme so that 80% of people are covered regardless of one's individual ability to pay. And this national insurance scheme intersects very positively with the digital advances made over here, it's quite easy for digital providers like Babel to come in and have a solution which now gets reimbursed through the national insurance, much simplifying the activities for an individual who's got a problem, goes to a clinic or accesses on an app. What we see in some other countries is a lack of clinics, lack of primary health care clinics, uh, particularly in the rural areas. And even where there are clinics, they may not be in a chain to receive the adequate commodities they need. So there may be stockouts of critical antibiotics or vaccines. Then there's the uh, you know, payment, whether there's a national insurance scheme or not. And now some of the questions are, how can we transplant the situation here to many other countries? To what extent is technology a game changer uh, in uh, strengthening uh, health systems in Africa? And what technologies are we talking about? What can be made uh, more accessible to do that? The one trend I'd point to in the last couple of years, more than 900 apps have emerged in sub-Saharan Africa, health apps. But only about half of those have actually been deployed and scaled nationally. Many of these are based on different platforms so that they're not really interoperable. There are 53 different apps for community health workers working on malaria. So you can imagine a single health worker could have multiple apps that they, they need to use. Somehow we need to deal with the, the fragmentation that has occurred. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has invested a great deal in strengthening global health, particularly in Africa. Would you kind of give us a couple of examples in terms of projects that have shown clear results for health system strengthening and, and, and health security? We are very committed to this area of surveillance, and we've invested in a network across Africa, which is called CHAMPS. It's about childhood mortality. They are actually able to... Um, when unfortunately a child dies, what was the cause of death? It's often not done very accurately. People often say, well, we have a lot of malaria in this town or in this area, so the child must have died of malaria. But that may not be true. So we've been able to, in a very respectful way, um, take some samples from uh, deceased individuals and understand precisely what the cause of death was. And this accurate data now is transforming how we think about what do children die of, and what are the major issues? It's not just malaria. In Mozambique, for instance, we have um, 
funded as well with, with partners, not just single sites doing this, but a network across the entire country that is able to establish why are kids dying? Do we know the real causes? And can we have more precise information so we can make the changes and interventions that we'd like? So I'm tremendously proud of the surveillance work we've been doing in Africa, but so much more needs to be done. And I think that the wake up call from the pandemic is going to get a lot more governments and other multilateral entities invested in surveillance, which hasn't been the case. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation recently announced a $140 million commitment over four years in support of new initiatives and research directed by African institutions and leaders that accelerate progress toward ending malaria and neglected tropical diseases, as well as contribute to the continent's COVID-19 recovery. And that's our health report for today. To stay in touch, find me on Twitter at Lenore Moudou. Esther? Thanks, Lino. Be sure to watch Lino Mudu's health report every Tuesday right here on Africa 54. Police say a 22-year-old man identified as a person of interest in a mass shooting during an Independence Day parade Monday in suburban Chicago that killed at least six people and wounded at least 30 others is under arrest following a massive manhunt. Highland Park Police Chief Lou Jogman says Robert E. Crimor III was taken into custody Monday evening as he drove several kilometers north of where the shooting occurred. Speaking with uh, WISN, one witness described Crimor's uh, demeanor at the time of his arrest. He said nothing. He had a very smug look. He, he was seemed to be very calm, cool, and collective. And... Um, which is just bizarre. Police declined to immediately identify Kremo as a suspect, but say identifying him as a person of interest, sharing his name and other information publicly was a serious step. Police say the gunman opened fire on the parade as its spectators from a nearby rooftop where a high-powered rifle was recovered. It's, it's sad that they're able to, to acquire these weapons and it's... it's commonplace now like we we don't blink anymore so I think until laws change it's gonna be more of the same sadly US President Joe Biden who hosted a group of veterans and other guests at the White House on Monday to honor Independence Day made reference to the 4th of July parade shooting in the state of Illinois the July 4th shooting was you all just heard what happened you all heard what happened today but each day, we're reminded there's nothing guaranteed about our democracy, nothing guaranteed about our way of life. We have to fight for it, defend it, and earn it by voting. The July 4th shooting was just the latest to shatter the rituals of American life. Schools, churches, grocery stores, and now community parades have all become killing grounds in recent months as U.S. lawmakers haggle over how far to go with restrictions on purchasing firearms. That's our show for today. We invite you to watch Africa 54 on our website at voafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, thanks for watching.